Department. Our subject is the marks of a spiritual person. Now, you will have noticed, I hope, that I've passed over chapter seven. And uh, there's a good reason for that, in that we did uh, carry out uh, studies on chapter seven separately, not too long ago. And they are part of a, a, a book uh, that uh, I wrote that came out quite recently, and that is the personal spiritual life. So I feel rather embarrassed at going through that material so soon and so quickly. And so if I may uh, do that shocking thing of referring you to the chapters in the book for uh, Romans 7 and pass immediately to Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation. Those who are in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to go in a simple expository manner through, if time permits, 12 or 13 verses of this chapter because they are a unit and they're such an important unit. Here are the marks of grace. Here is the way in which we are to view ourselves for the purposes of advance, sanctification, laid out so clearly. So I'm going to go through in a simple verse by verse manner. First of all, then in verse one, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You'll remember the concept of our having been in Christ when he was on Calvary's cross. Our past life was there with him, in him. And when he suffered and died, he took our guilt. Our guilt was there on Calvary. When he rose again from the dead, our certainty of ultimate resurrection was there because we were in him, the concept of being in him. And we're reminded of it here. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. But I'd like to come to these wor words. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Who walk. It's a literal translation from the Greek. We could refine it a little if uh, the translators had wanted to be more elaborate, but they've said enough. They could have translated along these lines, who walk everywhere or who walk all round. Literally, that's the meaning of the word. Not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And those extra words help us to grasp the sense in all our lives, in every department of life, wherever we are, at whatever time of day, we walk after or according to the spirit, not the flesh, if we are believers. It's not just that we are walking in the spirit at certain times, on the Lord's day, or in certain company. It's our general characteristic behavior that we walk according to the spirit and that is going to be explained who walk walk everywhere not after or according to the flesh that is sinful human nature that is what the apostle paul means by the flesh throughout these romans chapters who walk not according to the impulses of the flesh but according to or after the Spirit with a capital S, the Holy Spirit who dwells within. And we need to explain these things. What is it then, first of all, to set up the chapter to walk according to the flesh? Well, it means that we are people who are preoccupied by earthly things. Now, we're not necessarily talking about obvious unbelievers. It may be that somebody who has some level of profession of faith in Christ is actually unconverted and is walking according to the flesh. They may not perhaps commit extreme sins or sin so freely, but they are very much unconverted, unforgiven sinners in the sight of God. 
and yet they may assume and presume that they are converted people. So think of both extremes of sinfulness. Here it is, a person who walks according to the flesh, preoccupied by earthly desires, self-concerned chiefly. Now, the most earnest Christian will be self-concerned sometimes and will give way to earthly desires and lusts sometimes. But note, this is people who walk all around or everywhere. The general prevailing characteristic of their life and behavior is self-concern and earthly things. So that word walk was important. Walk everywhere. The general prevailing characteristic of life is that they walk according to sinful nature. Earthly things, entirely. Wealth, perhaps, career, possessions, home. These are the things that occupy our minds. Pleasures, maybe innocent pleasures, but no rationing of them. We, pleasures are everything to us. Ease, never involved in the Lord's work or Christian service. Is it possible? I hope there are not such people here, but in a, such a large gathering, it's likely there are, who have a profession of faith in Christ, but ease comes before Christian service. Daydreams and plans, you walk according to the flesh. They're all about earthly things that interest you, that excite you, that uh, you enjoy. Your conversation is full of earthly things, earthly admiration, earthly criticisms, all earthbound. It's never spiritual. Your ambitions, your time and energy, and nothing for the Lord. I remember some years ago, way back, I've been here such an awful long time, I wouldn't make a case history of anyone you conceivably knew. But I remember a young man who had aspirations for the ministry. But he wouldn't do a thing. He was the last person to ever volunteer for any Christian service. Didn't add up. You see, he thought according to human nature, according to sinful nature. It wasn't his general walk that he was interested in souls, in the Lord's things. It was quite different. He was interested in himself and his own things. So his profession of faith didn't add up. Neither did his desire to minister one day. And these are, this is the sign of whether we're the Lord's or not. There is therefore now no condemnation to whom? To them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to human nature, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, with the capital S. The Holy Spirit has worked a true work of redemption in their lives, and they have new hearts, and they walk according to his promptings. Well, we understand that particularly in terms of the conscience. Their conscience functions when they utter things they should never have said, when they do things they should not have done, or are about to, or they don't do things which they ought to do, then their conscience speaks, and that's a great concern to them. And so they pray to God and mend their ways. And this is constant activity. It's how they generally characteristically walk in self-correction by the help of God. The Spirit is at work within them, sanctifying, prompting the conscience, giving concerns. They're inclined to do things for the Lord and good things. And when they're at home, they'll do things to relieve others at home, whether it's small things or large things, because the Spirit has put within them a desire to do good and to be helpful, as well as not to sin. And so whether it's positive, doing good, or whether it's avoiding negative sin, it's a work of God going on in their lives, a sanctifying work. The Spirit is at work, 
And that's what is meant here. Who walk not after or according to human nature, but after or according to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who's working in the heart. So the Lord's work is important. The salvation of souls is important. The praying for souls, having a personal ministry of intercession, that's important. Increasing spiritual understanding is important. Exploring and loving the word of God, that's so important to us. That's our taste, to please him. In verse 8, this is brought out, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but those who walk according to the Spirit, this is a great concern, to please God. There's a great difference between the two different kinds of person. Future things excite our attention and our thinking because there's a work of the Spirit going on in our lives. Now let's just pass down to verse 2. In verse 2, you're introduced to two ruling forces or principles. For the law of the spirit of life, again, capital S, it's the Holy Spirit who is meant throughout this chapter, not one's personal spirit or disposition. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now the word law is used in verse two in a rather different sense from verse three. For what the law could not do, now that's clearly referring to the moral law of God. But in verse two, there are two laws and they're opposed to each other. One is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and the other is the law of sin and death. And this is what the apostle refers to. This law is a, a principle of living and a, a, a principle that applies to the person. The law of sin and death is the condemnation of God. Remember, it's within the Garden of Eden when our first parents was to were told that they took of the fruits of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. Now that's a law, a principle. You rebel against God and you die. It's the law of sin and death. You disobey God, sin comes in and it brings death in its wake. That's the law of sin and death, an unchangeable principle. And then the law of the spirit of life refers to the opposite, that if the Holy Spirit converts you, regenerates you, and f occupies you, and supervises your life, well then, you are safe, and you are saved, and you are heaven-bound. It's an inflexible, unchangeable force, or principle, or law. So there are two, and people are either under the one or under the other. Now there's going to be a conflict because how can you be under the unchanging absolute principle of sin and death and then be converted and be under the Holy Spirit who is the power of everlasting life? How can an unchangeable principle be changed? That's going to be explained in this chapter. But for the moment, we're introduced to these opposing forces. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from something I could never disentangle myself from, the law of sin and death. I'm under sentence of death. My body will die and I will go before God in judgment. But now verse three, for what the law could not do the most refined form of the law of sin and death is the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments. They are beautiful, they are wonderful, if only they could be kept. And even to keep them to a feeble extent will transform a society and make it so much better 
They are benevolent laws. They're for our good. They're not, they are, of course, reflecting the character of God and what he demands of us. But they are good and kind and beneficial. But there's a problem with the law. It isn't actually in the law. It's in us. Because the law is not equipped with the means of enabling us to keep its demands. It's not equipped with power or strength which it can impart to us to enable us to obey. It is a beautiful, perfect law, but it has no equipment, no power to enable us to conform. For what verse 3, the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, that is to say through our sinful nature, it couldn't tame that and change that and empower that. God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. God had the remedy. The law was not equipped. It was weak because of our sinful nature. And these beautiful words, dear friends, halfway through verse 3, we could pause almost at every one. God sending his own son. What a marvelous thing for the Apostle Paul to say. He doesn't write clinically under the inspiration of God. He writes feeling fully. He doesn't just say God sending his son He's writing under inspiration. God gives him every word, but the feeling is here too. God sending his own son. God acting in great love and sacrifice. Father and son, of course, were equal, but it is God's own son. You might say in human language, it hurt the family of heaven, that is to say the triune Godhead, so much to send the Son, his own Son, for us. In the likeness of sinful flesh, Christ didn't come in sinful flesh. There was no corruption in him, no sinful nature in him, to make that abundantly clear, he was born of a virgin. He did not inherit through a father the fall, the depravity of human nature. And that signals that fact to us. God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That means to say he was truly a man with the feelings of a man and the vulnerabilities of a man. He had a divine nature and a human nature somehow mystically united together. But it meant that he could feel our pain and he could be exposed to our temptation. But he never fell to a single temptation. He was entirely pure and holy. He came with the purity of God and though made vulnerable and being made truly a man with a human nature, he withstood every temptation and lived the most perfect and honorable life imaginable. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why the text almost raises a finger and says, don't you think for a moment, that Christ had a manhood vastly superior to ours, as though he had a manhood armor-plated by his divinity so that it was impossible for him to sin, and temptation would never touch him, and the horrors of this sinful world would never move him. No, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, with all the vulnerabilities, but all the purity which he maintained by his mighty 
and divine power. Sending his very own son to suffer all that he would suffer in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin with the express purpose of breaking the inflexible rule of sin and death. He condemned sin in the flesh, which meant this. It was God that did it. God sent his son so that he could condemn sin in the flesh. Sin must be condemned. It's the only way to cancel or break it. The human race is fallen. Every human being must die. It's an inflexible, unchangeable principle or law or force. But by putting our guilt upon Christ, God was able to condemn that sin in him. My sin was condemned and punished, but in him, not in me. So that's verse 3. For what the law could not do, it could not extract me from my fallen sinful state, in that it was weak through the flesh. It wasn't equipped to reform my sinful nature. God sending his own son, what love, in the likeness with all the vulnerability but none of the stain or of sin. For sin, God condemned my sin in the flesh, but in the flesh of Christ, he took the pain. The whole gospel is in that verse. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Legally, legally, I could be treated as though I had never sinned and justified freely because my sin has been punished. But in Christ, legally, actually, God would give me a new nature. His spirit would recreate me so that I desired not to sin and fought against sin. And entirely at the moment of death, when I would be set free from the last vestiges of sin, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. How can I tell if I am one of those in whom the Spirit dwells, who has been forgiven and transformed? Second part of verse 4. This is the sign of the truly saved, who walk not after the flesh, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, who walk all around or everywhere. Their general prevailing feature of life is not to give way to sinful nature, but to be prompted by the Spirit through the conscience and his work within. In us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Holy Spirit of God. Well, tell me more, Paul. How precisely can I tell? Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh, walk according to the flesh, do mind, think upon, mind. It's literally that in the Greek. The mind in action, all our thinking. Those who are living according to the flesh do think about and focus on, in their minds, the things of the flesh, sinful nature. But they that are after the Spirit, less, walk according to the Holy Spirit, they mind or think upon the things of the Spirit. That's the difference. They think about escaping sin. They think about serving the Lord. They think about prayer in all circumstances. They trust the Lord. They want to trust him. And when the devil comes and says to them, oh, everything's going wrong for you. There's this great 
lack in your life that you so need and it isn't being given to you, you should be grumbling and complaining. You should feel bad. You should even be stretched to the point where you think the Lord is taking no interest in you and if life is unreasonably harsh for you. But no, if you're walking according to the Spirit, though you may give way sometimes, the prevailing characteristic in your life is that you say to yourself, I am a child of God and I trust him in everything. And he's blessed me and proved himself to me. And my assignment is to walk by faith and I'm going to praise him and thank him and trust him and not be miserable and reflect on these things that the devil puts in my mind. Why you walk after the Spirit, according to the Spirit. And so you hear the command of the word, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And you begin to count your blessings and reflect on the wonders of your conversion and what God has done for you. They that are after the flesh, however, think about the things of the flesh. They've got no encouragement, no relief, no help. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. What a difference between the two people. Now look at verse 6. For to be carnally minded, the word carnally is the same as flesh. To be fleshly minded, that is to say to be thinking about according to fallen human nature, is death. It's a sure sign you're not saved. But to be spiritually minded, and it's the same to be thinking about your direction by the Holy Spirit, is life and peace. You have power to be better, to improve, to serve the Lord. And it's peace, it's assurance. Do you know that probably, I don't know whether it's 70%, 80%, 90%, but you know, whatever is the fraction, most of our assurance comes from the fact that we're battling against sin. That's, that's where our assurance is derived from. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, assurance and certainty of communion with God. Let me explain it to you. It's, it's, it, it's very straightforward. To be spiritually minded, I have done wrong. I have said wrong. I shouldn't have spoken like that. I have awarded myself far too much leisure. I have not served the Lord. I have not prayed to him as I should have done this day. I have not helped this person and that person. Oh Lord, forgive me. Help me to do better. I will do this. I will make these resolutions. I will do better in the future. If that's how you think, if that's how you live, you are assured of salvation because you know the Spirit is working within you. You know you wouldn't be like that if you weren't a child of God. You wouldn't be so conscientious. You wouldn't be so anxious. You wouldn't be so concerned. You wouldn't be so touched by your conscience, so longing to please the Lord and to be productive and fruitful and profitable. You're a child of God. That's the biggest piece of evidence you'll ever have. Don't wander about saying to yourself, oh Lord, why doesn't assurance drop out of the heavens and fill my heart with certainty and peace? When the Apostle Paul says, if you walk in the Spirit, if the battle is on and the struggle is on and the promptings are there and the desires and the constant reaching forward, you know you're a child of God. And this theme is pursued here. Verse 7 because the carnal mind, that is to say the one who thinks in terms and according to sinful nature, 
is enmity against God, hostility towards him. That's what it means in verse 7. It's opposition to God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, I have something to say about this, because hostility to God doesn't always express itself as direct hostility to him. You, you see this in uh, the Pentateuch, repeatedly in the journeyings of the children of Israel in the wilderness. They murmured. Who did they murmur against? It wasn't God. It was Moses. Then it was Moses and Aaron. It wasn't God. Ah, no. Sometimes it was against God, but that's rare. Usually, it was against his servants. It was against Moses. They never articulated hostility or hatred to God. They directed their hostility to Moses. And God said to Moses, it isn't against you, Moses, it's against me. I am the one they really hate. I am the one they oppose, not you. And so it is today. It could be, you remember I began by saying that the unconverted person, he might be out of church, in the world, uh, obvious unbeliever, maybe he's hostile to God too, commits all kinds of sins, but then we've got unbelievers in the church. Sometimes they don't know they're unbelievers. They've never faced the facts. I'm not thinking of anybody here, believe me. But as I said before, in a gathering so large, there are bound to be deluded people. And this is how it works. You're hostile to God. You say, no, I'm not. I love God. I stand up for God. I am not against God. Ah, but like the children of Israel, your hostility may be directed Maybe to me. I don't know of hostility directed to me. You haven't told me, but it may be. And this is how, let me give an example and then it'll become obvious. About six or seven years ago, I wrote an article in the Sword and Trowel. It wasn't a long one, it was quite short, it was an editorial. And I was very concerned about the number of people in different parts of the world in the USA, but coming here too, who say, we're Calvinists, we believe the Reformed faith, and yet their lives and the things they did and allowed were utterly worldly. And their churches were worldly, and their worship was worldly. And there was this great contradiction. So I wrote an article, and it was simply a concern about the fact that uh, Calvinism and worldliness are joined together. And that's impossible. The new Calvinism, that you could be a believer, you could hold the doctrines of grace and the reformed faith, and you could still live very similarly to a worldling. Now that article caused quite a reaction. In fact, there were two, if not three, pastors conferences where they ask consent to print the article off and put it on the seats of every pastor in the conference. They were for it. They wanted the alarm to be sounded that this was wrong and shouldn't happen. But equally, there was a tremendous reaction from people who were very angry about the article. These were the people who would say, we are Calvinists, we are Christians, we are, and yet, no separation from the world, living completely according to the flesh in many ways. Now, they didn't say in their response, they went on blogs and wrote articles themselves and so on, but mainly in the blogging world, they didn't say, Masters is wrong for this reason or for that reason, because he's misunderstood this scripture or that scripture, and it's perfectly okay to be worldlings and Christians at the same time for this biblical reason or that. They weren't writing like that. They didn't offer any reasoning. 
All they did was abuse the writer of the article. That's me. So I had, on the one hand, people agreeing, on the other hand, a torrent of abuse. This unmentionable individual shouldn't be writing such rubbish, take no notice of him, and so on. Now, that's interesting, because I fear that that could be, in many cases, an indication that those people aren't even saved. Oh, I deserve criticism frequently, as you will well know. But I don't think I did in this case. I was simply presenting a biblical position. And they hated me. You can't say that. You shouldn't say that to us and all the rest of it. And that's how it works. The scripture is always true. The carnal mind, the mind of the flesh, is enmity, hostility, anger, hatred of God. But it's expressed to Moses and to Aaron, not to God. And so it is today. Now, there could be a member of our congregation this morning. I don't know that there is. But there could be somebody who says, well, I'm a Christian, and I believe the doctrines of the faith, but I don't like the things you preach. This harking on about the fact we ought to be witnessing to our souls, we ought to be involved in Christian service, we mustn't do this and we mustn't do that, and we can't go home and listen to rock music and all this kind of thing, and we shouldn't be dancing like worldlings. I don't like that. I hate that. I don't want that. Well, you may not be articulating hostility directly to God, but that's what you're doing. Because in this case, the preacher is getting it from God. And he's getting it from God's word. And your hostility to the true life of a Christian is being directed to the preacher. I don't, like, don't agree with that. I shouldn't say that. Shouldn't criticize us for that. Now... This is the challenge, and I'm saying this not to vindicate myself, but because I don't want people, anyone here, if there is such a person or there are such people, to be unsaved and not know it. That's the issue. Because the fleshly mind, the carnal mind, is hostility against God, though it may be expressed against the preacher or against the teaching. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Unconverted, tastes all wrong. Verse 8, So then they that are in the flesh, living according, dominated by sinful nature, cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, verse 9, but in the spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. How do I know if I have the Spirit of Christ? Well, that's what the Apostle has been reasoning. If you've got the Spirit of Christ, there's a battle going on. You can't sin easily. You can't sin in cold blood. You can't plan to sin. Your conscience gets in the way. You can't be lazy, at ease, spiritually. You're concerned for the lost, and you want to do what's right. You want to please him who came from heaven to earth to suffer and to die for you. You're ruled by the Spirit. You can't see him. You can't hear his voice. But his touch is upon you. You're uncomfortable and uneasy as a backslider or as a worldling. Your tastes have been changed. That's how you know if you've got the Spirit of God. Verse 10, and if Christ be in you, this is the verse nobody understands. It's actually quite straightforward. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. What does that mean? If Christ is in you, the body is still going to die. The sentence of death will still be carried out in your body. 
What God threatened in the Garden of Eden has come to pass. And the death of every member of the human race is essential. If Christ be in you, yes, your body is as good as dead because one day you will die and the sentence in that respect will be carried out. But don't worry. The Spirit, with a capital S, modern versions put it to a small s in this verse, which is quite wrong and impossible. The Holy Spirit is life because of righteousness. So this is the meaning of the second half of the verse. The Holy Spirit, King James Version has got it, capital S, and that's right because all the previous verses are the Holy Spirit and all the following verses are the Holy Spirit and it can't be all of a sudden your personal disposition just once in this verse. If Christ be in you, the Holy Spirit is life and is giving you life. And the Holy Spirit can do that and give you spiritual life because of righteousness. You could translate that because of justification. It's the same word. Because of righteousness. The righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you. You're a believer. And therefore the Spirit can give you life. So you're going to die. But your soul is alive. And will go on. Will go to Christ. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him, and what a consolation this is, if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. So if Christ is in you, the body is as good as dead because of sin, and you will die, but your spirit is is alive because the Spirit is in you. Because you've been, Christ has died for you and imputed his righteousness to you. And therefore that same Spirit who was the Spirit of God the Father who raised Christ, it's the Father that's referred to in verse 11, if the Spirit of him, capital H we would write it with today, if the Spirit of God the Father who raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you, then you're going to rise from the dead too. He has the power to do it. He's demonstrated it. He's going to quicken your mortal body. So the two verses say, if Christ is in you, your body will die, but don't worry, because the Holy Spirit within you, and, and ultimately your body will be reassembled at the day of resurrection and brought back to life. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, we have an obligation, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Maybe you're living according to nature. Maybe you are living according to the flesh, even as a converted person. Give it up at once. You have a great debt and an obligation to God who's delivered you. Not to follow the dictates of human nature but to live according to the prompting of the spirit for if you live I'm going to deal with this another time but look at this great 13th verse if you live after the flesh you shall die it means you're not a Christian but if ye through the spirit do mortify put to death the deeds of the body how do you put to death the deeds of the body that we'll consider another time you shall live, for as many, our closing words, verse 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, oh, people make foolish mistakes. The Lord led me to do this. The Lord led me to do that. Haven't you heard it from many people? The Spirit spoke to me. Why don't you know I'm a superior Christian? He speaks in my ear. Pastor, I, should do, I believe I should do this. God is leading me. How is he leading you? Well, he's told me. How did he tell you? Well, it came into my mind, so it must be from him. I'm a, I'm a superior Christian. He communicates directly with me. I'm led by the Spirit. 
That's not what it means. Being led by the Spirit means all that the Apostle has been talking about in the preceding verses. He's explained it at great length. Being led by the Spirit means that your conscience works over time. That you know your duties to do good here, to do good there. And the Spirit prompts you to those things. He doesn't communicate to you special privileged information. You are to go to such and such a place today. You are to do this. You are to do that. He communicates you general desires for good works and the prompting of the conscience. And if you listen and if you are striving, it proves you are a believer. You are saved. The Spirit is at work. And that it is, that's what it means to be led by the Spirit. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God in the way we've been defining, they are the sons and the daughters of the living God. And may this be true of us all. Dear friends, it's a complicated chapter and I hope that this has helped to see the theme that runs through all the verses.